So when we had the, the Iran hostage rescue mission, we're looking at what assets do we have to do this mission? You know, you, you know, you got to go inland, you know, it's just the remoteness of getting to Tehran in the middle of Iran. Um, you know, what helicopter assets did we have available that could carry us to do this mission? And at that time, it was the 53s, and in particular, it was these RH-53D helicopters. Now, an RH is a Navy helicopter. RH-53D models are used for countermining. So how they're, they're, they're to do, they're to search the seas during daylight hours, doing grid patterns, carrying a, uh, a thing that de helps detect mines, sea mines that they drag along in the water uh, and do grid patterns in the daytime. So those were the helicopters that we had. And initially we had the Navy pilots that flew those helicopters. But, you know, to go, to go flying in the deserts, wearing night vision goggles, uh, it just, we just were having problems with the train up that they were, it would took them too long to train up. Um, they would get lost. They would not land where we wanted them to land. Um, it, it, we just had problems with the Navy pilots. So we got, so we went and got Marine pilots to fly the helicopters. The um, RH-50, so, the Marines, even though they fly 53s, it's still a different 53. It's a, not a Marine 53, it's a Navy 53. So, but we still had problems with the, with the Marine pilots try, you know, not landing where we wanted to land and all this other We never did a complete one exercise. We only did piecemeal exercises. One of the reasons that we didn't do a complete overall exercise of the mission was operational security you know that's what was said you know and we had the internal fuel tanks that were in the 53s these are fiberglass tanks that were in the cargo compartment to do the distance so we had eight 53s on the uss nimitz the aircraft carrier in the indian ocean and then we were in egypt our our staging base was uh, there in Egypt at Wadakinya. Then we flew in from Wadakinya into Masaria in Oman, and that's where we launched on the MCs. We had three MC-130E models, and then we had uh, three EC-130E models. And EC-130 is the communication EC, and you put them a pod in there, a communication pod in the cargo thing. But instead we put fuel bladders to refill the helicopters. And I believe they were three, two, 3,000 gallons, maybe 6,000 gallons of fuel in, in these three EC-130s to fill up the helicopters when they land. So we all go to Desert One. Well, we encounter, I was on the first MC-130 that went in. Colonel Beckwith was on it, um, and the Ranger Roadblock team was on it. B Squadron, I was in B Squadron. B Squadron was on first MC 130. Um, so we encounter the haboos, the dust storms. So our guys with the fixed wing aircraft, we just went above the haboos. Now we're flying at you know nap of the earth type flying to go avoid being detected by radar. Well, the thing is, radar cannot penetrate dust storms. So you got a perfect, so we've just flew on top of the dust storm and we carried on. Well, somehow the Marines didn't, weren't verified, you know, weren't about, taught about the haboos, the dust storms that will, appear this time of the year in the desert. And what, if you encounter a dust storm, what would you do? I, so they still kept flying into the dust storm. Instead of getting up on top of the dust storm and flying above it, 
they continued to fly through it. Now we could not communicate back and forth uh, secure. The, the Marines had SATCOM radios in the helicopter, but those SATCOM radios uh, you, back then, you had to actually land the helicopter and set up the antenna, the right compass as, and azimuth. And so they would have had to stop, land, to talk to us to secure communications. So they, they flew through the first dust storm and then, well, we lost two helicopters. We lost one helicopter, uh, I believe, let's see, one turned back to the Nimitz. Well, one set down because they got a, a BIM light, which is a, built, a blade indicator malfunction light. The blades of the helicopters have nitrogen gas in there. So if there's a crack in the blade, uh, the nitrogen would escape and then a light would indicate that you lost nitrogen. So the reason you lost nitrogen is there's a crack in the blade. For marine, hel marine helicopters, you get a, a BIM light comes on and it could, and you can get malfunction BIM lights, you know, it could be just a light malfunction but you to land the helicopter immediately. The R-53s, you can still fly them with a BIM light on, but the Marines didn't know that. Uh, so they landed this helicopter, jumped out, got into another helicopter that landed and then it continued on and one turned back to the aircraft carrier. So when, so when we were at the Desert One site, well, first of all, when we flew in, there was lights on the roadway next to the airfield. There was traffic at night. We were told that this is a remote area. Nobody's going through here. So we we orbited and then we landed when the lights went away. As soon as we landed, opened up the, the ramp, here comes a pair of headlights coming down the road. And so Colonel Beckwith hollers, stop that bus. Now our weapons, we got our weapons in plastic bags to protect them from the dust and because we don't figure we're going to need them right away. So ripping off the plastic and stuff like that. One of the Rangers fires a 40 millimeter in front of the bus and the bus stops. Then we board the bus and there's 44 Iranians on the bus. So now we have 44 Iranian detainees. So we take them off the bus. I go on the bus and I search the bus for anything that could be of a problem to us that was on the bus. So we have them in the ditch and we're guarding them in the ditch. We have 44 Iranians. And these are children to old people. Only recently did I find out that all the people on the bus were related to each other. They were going to a family reunion in the next town over. And so they were going to a family reunion and that's what they were doing on the road that night. And they were, yeah, so we got them. Now what we're gonna do with them, plan was they would fly out of one of the fixed wings back to Oman, would take them back to Egypt and then we would release them in the future. You know, at, when the mission was all over, we would release them. Then another, Another vehicle is coming up down the road, and that's that oil tanker truck. So then one of the Rangers fires an M72 law at the truck, but he misses the actually misses the truck, and the law actually hits the ground underneath the truck, detonates, but he does catch the truck, fuel truck on fire. So he jumps out, and there's a vehicle following the fuel truck, and he jumps into the fuel truck and then they take off, they're gone. So uh, then the tanker's sitting there burning and we're waiting, you know, all the fixed wing are landing and we're waiting for the helicopters. The helicopters are way, way late, you know, and fixed wing are still running, props are still going, they're not shutting off engines. We're still running on the ground, but it's running very late. All of a sudden that tanker truck blows up and it's just a huge fireball just like that. And all these uh, hostages we have, they're, 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 they're moaning, whoa, whoa. It looked probably like 
the third world war just you know world war three just started and because you know, aircraft are landing uh you know people are going by them we're carrying car, uh, camouflage netting and different things and finally the helicopters are coming in there they saw the fireball and so they came on in they were wiped out i can tell you you looked on the faces of the helicopter crews those two dust storms that they had gone through they they were they were at their wits end they were fatigued they were they were. and then so but we're still going on the mission we're still we're, we're getting the helicopters in place we're refueling them and stuff and then all of a sudden another helicopter develops hydraulic problems i mean serious hydraulic problems they say it can't fly so we're down to five helicopters we can't beckwith was asked if we wanted to reduce the rescue force i mean this is a 13 acre compound i believe it's 13 acres compound that we have to search for hostages with many many buildings um to reduce the amount of rescue forces because we have the amount of rescue forces and we have 53 hostages. This is my biggest pet peeve too, is a lot of times you'll see on like one of the recent documentaries that we were going to rescue 52 hostages and other things I've seen that we were going to rescue 52 hostages. We were going to rescue 53 hostages. I'm going to turn this light on here. <laughs> uh, what happened was two months after our rescue attempt, a guy named last name of Queen developed a serious illness and the Iraqis released him uh, because they didn't want him to die in their care. Uh, so he was, this guy Queen, State Department guy was released and I believe he had MS. Uh, and so on the final days when all the hostages were released, you know, on uh, the uh, Reagan's inauguration, uh, there was 52 hostages. But when we were going in, there was 53 hostages. We weren't going to leave anybody behind. So anyway, um, on this thing, uh, that that they had, we aborted the mission because we we could not bring with five helicopters bring everybody out you know the rescue force and the 53 hostages so the mission beckwith made the made the the call to board jimmy carter that had communications back in dc he concurred with the ground commander colonel beckwith to abort mission that you know, we were, we weren't going to give up on the mission. You know, we would still try to relaunch. Hopefully, we could cover our tracks, even though we got forty four Iranians and we destroyed a truck on the road. We were still hoping that maybe we could regroup it and relaunch the missions. Helicopters were refilled; they would fly back to the carrier, and we would, you know. So then we loaded so. B squadron, my group, we loaded, went into the EC-130 and that the fuel bird, they had giant, still had fuel in it and they had two helicopters behind us. Well, the helicopter that landed to our left rear, when it landed, it flattened all of its tires. So the CCT and our props were going all the whole time. We never shut off the engines. So the CCT wanted to move the two helicopters because they had and refuel, move them away so that they would not get hit with all the dirt that we would be kicking up uh, to taxi out of there. And um, and that was what's going to happen. Now, our aircraft was, you know, pretty low on, getting low on fuel, the fixed wing aircraft, because they've been running the whole time. Well, when this left rear helicopter came up and came around, it got the it got disoriented. It kicked up dust when it took off. We got our props going. Anyway, it came in and it hit in the right, the left front of our our aircraft. 
the the actual blades actually were cutting into the top of our aircraft. The next thing I know, we don't know what's going on. We don't, you know, we're inside all buttoned up. It's dark inside, no lights are on. Next thing you know, so this this commotion of the props cutting in, this left front cockpit door blows in, just boom, an explosion. And it comes in with a ball of fire. Now, what happened was the internal, the fuel tank, the the extra fuel tank that was in the cargo compartment of the 53 blew up, cracked and blew up. The three crew, Marine crewmen that were in the cargo compartment were killed. The two Marine pilot co-pilots it actually escaped out of the hatches or window hatches. They were burned badly. They even had third degree burns. They inhaled the, the hot gases and stuff like that. The five Air Force crewmen that were in front when that door came in, they were killed. They were, they were trapped up in the front and they, they were killed. So the flames came in and uh, so we op so we're get we're getting out. They open up not knowing what's going on. Somebody cracked the left rear paratrooper door, the side that the aircraft, the helicopter crashed on. As soon as they cracked it, there was flames, so they put it down. We opened up the right rear door and we started going out of that door. Just I was up near the front. You know, I had taken off my body armor. I had taken, I had a five gallon thing of water that I had a pack frame with five gallons of water that I'd been carrying around. Um, and, uh, and all my equipment, and I just laid it down when we got on the aircraft. Now we're evacuating. Uh, Sergeant Major Dick Cheney, I remember him saying, don't panic. Uh, and we are just going through that door. And I did actually did not think that I would have, I thought at any second I was going to die. I, I even said, you know, oh God, is this how it's going to end? Because I thought that I only had moments to live. Uh, got to the door, go through it. I, I could hear small arms that were cooking off inside the, the aircraft. When I exit, I could hear our hand grenades that we had going off, the explosion of hand grenades going off in the heat. Um, I got a little ways away. We had some red eye missiles that were on board uh, to cover air security. Uh, a red eye missile came, went right through the aircraft and just went out into the desert. Uh, all the other aircraft were moving away from us because everything was just blowing up eventually i got on another ec-130 on the and when i got on it the pilot and co-pilot were already of the helicopter were already on the ec-130 and the, the co-pilot was up front and back towards the ramp was the pilot and he was just in pain people were walking around so i started giving medical aid helping him breathe and everything to the pilot he had a nylon cord that around his neck that was melted into his neck i cut that away mm -hmm. he his hands were burned uh so then we then we took off and when we took off the aircraft hit something i mean we hit something hard came down then we went back up and then the pilot says that don't know how good our landing gear is going to be when we land, but, you know, uh, we might have damaged our landing gear. And then on the way back, the pilot says, uh, we're really low on fuel and we don't know if we can make it back and we might have to ditch at sea. And I'm like, boy, what a night. Uh, and then I, I gave medical aid to the pilot. Um, we had some more, gave him some morphine. We had another lesson learned. All we had was these little mess uh, first aid kits that are in the, the aircraft, that, that they're nothing. 
there should have been lesson learned a medical package with IVs and everything on each aircraft because I needed to give this guy IVs. You know, he's in shock, he's been burned. Uh, anyway, I I met him again. 30 years later at one of our reunions at Arlington National Cemetery. And I talked to the pilot that, and uh, he was, he was uh, real grateful for my care and stuff like that. He told me that I was his hero, which was, you know, something, but yeah, that was one of the things I wrote up too after action report was each aircraft needs a full package of medical gear. I mean, I we didn't have any morphine with us. We had Percocet in our E and E package. The dead A guys, the Berlin dead A guys that were with us, they had morphine, and that's where I got the morphine from from the dead A guys. Um, I just kept him comfortable breathing, kept him comfortable. That's you all know, I could do. I, I, I've read about um, Operation Eagle Claw in um, Colonel Beckwith's book and in uh, Eric Haney's book. And I've got to tell you, like, when I read the stories in those books, like my heart rate got up, right? Because I can, I can, having done some army things, right? Like nothing to, to that level, but like I've done army things, so I can kind of put myself there. But like hearing you tell the story, um like i'm just kind of blown away like it just sounds like mass chaos from start to finish um with the sandstorms rotor wash bus going off uh, uh, tanker blowing up the helicopter coming through the ec-130 i mean what that must have looked like what that must have felt like the i i, I don't know and just i mean and, and you know tyree and i we, we served in iraq in 04 so we saw uh, um, our share of combat. And so we're, we're pretty familiar with the feeling of, oh God, this is where it ends. But geez, I cannot even imagine. Um, I don't know. Like I can't even imagine in that scenario. And the fact that you're able to tell the story um, with like a smile on your face at times. Um, and the fact that you remain so humble uh, about like, I mean, that that pilot's life like was literally in your hands. And 30 years later, he's calling you your, your, your he's calling you your, uh, his hero. And, and, you know, it, I, I know that it, it probably it definitely means something to you. But at the same time, like you have this like this level of like humble about you. Yeah, the, but there was some humorous things that took place when, you know, we were in the aircraft, props were going. The next thing you expected was the brakes to be released and we'd start taxiing. It was all dark inside. We were tired and stuff like that. Some of the guys started to doze, were sleeping. One of them was Frank McKinnon. Frank has since passed away, good friend of mine, but he passed away from cancer. Frank, when all this stuff was going on, he woke up and here's all this chaos inside the aircraft going up. Frank thought we we were take we had taken off and we were actually airborne. And then when he saw us jumping out of the aircraft, we don't have any parachutes on. Frank says, what are these fools doing? They're <laughs> jumping jumping out of an aircraft with no parachute, it was burning. Uh, but Frank didn't have any better ideas. So he followed suit, he went to the door. And of course, Frank immediately when he got to the door, he got into the position of being flat and stable. And and Frank landed square on his you know stomach and knocked the wind, the wind was knocked at him and then people were walking over him and then got to his feet, but Frank tells the story you know, that uh, that's what he was thinking. He thought we were in the air. I can I knew we were on the ground. I can't imagine if I thought we were in the air jumping out of an airplane. And and then when we are on. Uh, um uh, uh in the the other aircraft you know and um after we gotten into the aircraft um so we were looking so i didn't know you know anybody had any morphine so i was you know calling for some you know percodan you know percocet percodan so i was saying uh 
check your E and E kits and you know get some you know we need some Percodan. And and Nick and this guy Glenn Nichols uh, uh said, no who was that uh oh yeah it was uh I'm trying to think is it was Jim Switters maybe it was Jim it says check your E and E kits for Percodan and then one of our guys Bruno uh Bruno heard he says, Nick says, we, oh yeah, he said, Nick says we got an E and E to Percodan. And, and then Jim Switters says, I'm not leaving this aircraft. You know, Bruno was all set to go in E and E to Percodan. Uh, I don't know where he would have gone, <laughs> but um, he got, you know, so Bruno was going to go to Percodan, E and E to Percodan. Well, you know, that confusion. Go ahead. So yeah. Oh yeah. So there was, you know, after you know, we telling these stories, you know, when we got on when we landed in Oman, you know, we took head count. That's where we knew we did we didn't have any accountability. No matter what Bex's book said, there was no accountability at Desert One. It was just and we had struck charges in each of those helicopters, and they could have been and I built those destruct charges to blow those helicopters up, but we trained the helicopter crews and they immediately, when the accident took place, they abandoned those helicopters, left them running and jumped into the fixed wing aircraft. And they could have flown back, but they jumped into the fixed wing aircraft. And, and that's how the Iranians got a lot of classified information because they weren't destroyed. And, uh, so, you know, it's just, you know, things were just confused. And then when we landed, like I said, in Oman, and then I'm getting in, we're, we're getting into the C-141 and Beck was at the head of the C-141 that we're getting into. So I go up there, Don Feeney and I go up to Colonel Beckwith and Colonel Beckwith looks at us. We don't have any weapons. We have no gear, no nothing. And he says, where's where's all your equipment where's your rifle and stuff like that he says it's back there in that plane that burned up he said well you know you're stupid and don feeney and i look at each other and we said well we're stupid we're, we're alive you know uh i didn't even know i'd be alive uh so it, you know because it took all that stuff off you know I, I even had all my money. I had $10,000. I had $5,000 in American money and $5,000 in Iranian money. So where are you going to put it? I put it in between the sheets and my body armor. To, you know, I figured that was a good place, but that, it got burned up in that plane. Uh, but Beckwith, like Beckwith later apologized. He did. But he it was just the stress of the moment, you know, and and he didn't he did really didn't realize i don't think how bad things were inside that that aircraft he had heard that somebody had gone back inside the aircraft and got their car 15 that never happened they got out with that he misheard that nobody that got out of that air burning aircraft ever went back in i can tell you that why would um, you want to gosh no, to grab your weapon. Things were blowing up in there. It yeah. was a, I feel like, uh, I don't know what y'all's budget was then, but I feel like I can get a new weapon. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had to write a statement, too, that my yeah. money got burned up. <laughs> but you, it did like a flipple for a field loss on a, <laughs> a helicopter crash into your EC-130. <laughs> yeah, so that was that one. But, uh,